uh, welcome um, everyone that is here with us today here in uh, here in Basel uh, and also the ones that are joining online for this uh, presentation. There's a couple of people who are joining also from online, just that so you know. <clears throat> and uh, is everything working fine online? Okay, thanks. Thanks very much. So today we have with us um, Dr. Florian Weigand. He will talk about <coughs> his book <coughs> that is focusing on legitimacy and authority in Afghanistan. Uh, a, a bigger group of people here present in today's uh, talk are students who are already familiar with your work. They've read one of your papers. Uh, so I'm sure they have lots of questions for you now. What has changed in the meantime? Because the paper was from 2017. So you will have some uh, informed questions coming uh, towards the end. Uh, so Florian um, is a co-director of the Center on Armed Groups that is based in Geneva. Uh, he's also a research fellow at the uh, LSE and ODI. And just add some more things if you want to add about yourself. Perfect. I'm okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. He was also... Um, at the UN mission in Afghanistan uh, and had several other uh, assignments that he will share with the, with the audience later on. And um, he will introduce his latest book. He's published already two books and has co-edited another book, both focusing on Afghanistan. Uh, the first one was more on borders and related and uh, related crime with borders. And the last one, the, the one that he will talk about today is on uh, authority and legitimacy uh, of Taliban in Afghanistan. Uh, after his talk, you will be then uh, the, his work will be then discussed by uh, Tobias Hagman. He's the senior program officer from Swiss Fees. and he's also worked is extensively on smuggling and political violence, and then how to deal with it. Um, and then uh, afterwards, and we also are happy to have with us uh, Zulfia Abave from the University of South Wales, uh, and she's interested in topics of women and peacekeeping, uh, and also. Uh, specifically on Afghanistan, and she's from Afghanistan herself. So it's, uh, it's a pleasure to uh, Thank you so much. to do the talk. Thank you so much, Metka, for the very kind introduction. And thank you, everyone, for attending. This is a, this is a great crowd. Uh, really nice meeting all of you, and thank you for your interest in this topic. Um, so as Metka has kindly already introduced, I'm going to talk about a book which is called Waiting for Dignity, Legitimacy and Authority in Afghanistan. And, just before I get into it, uh, I just really invite you to interrupt me at any point of time. If I'm speaking too fast, too slow, if anything is unclear, please feel free to jump in. I really don't mind at all. Um, I think we have plenty of time in the second half for questions, but if there's something pressing, please uh, let me know and jump in and we can discuss it at that point of time. So I just have to figure out how to jump to the next slide. Um... Not like this. Ah, thank you. So perhaps the most essential question, what is this book actually about? So the title perhaps doesn't really tell you too much. It says authority, legitimacy, Afghanistan has three keywords. But what I really try to do in this book is kind of getting a better sense of what actually constitutes legitimacy and conflict zones and how different types of authorities can actually build legitimacy in a conflict environment. So I actually have a very theoretical question that I try to answer. And in the course of the presentation, I'll start on this very abstract theoretical level and then kind of dive into a case study. So I kind of explored this research question and try to address it by doing research in Afghanistan, looking at the war between 2001 and 2021. Um, most of the research was conducted between 2014 and 2019. And what I kind of try to do is, instead of kind of having my own answer on what constitutes legitimacy, is kind of asking as many people as possible about this. So I kind of asked normal people um, on the street in different parts of the country and uh, the authorities themselves who kind of claim to have legitimacy. So that was kind of the idea for the entire research project. But perhaps, as I, as I said, I'm going to start on a very kind of theoretical abstract level, but no worries, it's going to get a bit more tangible over time. Um, I wanted to kick it off with the question of what is actually legitimacy and when is an authority legitimate? I don't know. I, I'm sure many of you have kind of read about legitimacy or have kind of initial ideas. Is, is, are there any immediate answers anyone would have to this? <laughs> no. No worries, I'm not. So basically, 
there are all sorts of theories, of course. Uh, it is political science, it is sociology, there are loads of ideas out there. I tried to symbolize some of them um, with these various um, things that I try to Google. Um, so, of course, some people may say legitimacy is tied to a certain ideology. So, for instance, uh, people may think only a capitalist system, a communist system, or a system that's got dominated by a certain religious ideology has legitimacy. But actually, that's quite, quite niche. I think what's much more common is kind of this entire the theory that builds on Weber, um, who kind of distinguish between traditional legitimacy, such as this king here, um, charismatic legitimacy, a charismatic leader, or something that's rational legal, such as a democratic system. I guess what a democratic system could look like could take many different forms. Just kind of um, put a couple of different symbols here. As we're in Switzerland, I put some elections on here. I put the UK parliament there as well. And perhaps if people are so inclined, more like this kind of discursive nature of democracy that kind of Habermas defines with the public sphere and people discussing in coffee houses, um, I have a photo, a picture of that as well. So basically all sorts of ideas. And I'm going to try just for a very few minutes to structure these a little bit before getting into the complications we have with these. So I think just as a very rough way of kind of trying to understand different forms of legitimacy, I think we can define, uh, we can distinguish between definitions of legitimacy that are more normative in nature. So basically what's usually discussed in political theory or philosophy, such as Hannah Arendt here saying, for instance, power springs up whenever people get together and act in concert, but it derives its legitimacy from the initial getting together rather than from any action that may follow. So this kind of initial getting together is the foundation moment of legitimacy, or of course, Hobb with this idea of the social contract. But then we also have kind of understandings and approaches to legitimacy that are a bit more empirical, and that's kind of where I situate myself at this project. So where we kind of look at what do people actually think about legitimacy? Of course, that might ultimately be the same as the kind of more normative definition that might translate into that, but it's more an analytical starting point rather than a predefined one. And I guess the challenge that comes with that is that many people may have very different views. Everyone may have their own perspective on what actually constitute legitimate authority. But actually Weber is quite helpful in that sense because Weber basically says we can understand legitimacy as voluntary obedience to social control. Sounds very technocratic, but basically he's saying if people voluntarily obey, that kind of indicates some form of legitimacy. And now we kind of know what to look for in an empirical setting, this kind of form of behavior or this form of perception that reflects this voluntary obedience to social control. But we can distinguish it from, and this is not Weber, this is more my own analysis, from kind of forms of obedience that are based on coercion. This is what I would call, so we would say there's an authority and it can either be based on force or it can be based on legitimacy. Of course, it's just a Weberian idea type, has nothing to do with reality where all of this is usually mixed and there is um, people like authority will be resting on both the ability to exercise force as well as legitimacy. But at least it kind of provides a bit of... Uh, does this work? Perfect. It provides a bit of guidance for what to look for when conducting research. I promise I'm going to stop boring you with definitions very soon, but I think basically if we accept that, roughly speaking, we can kind of distinguish between different forms of legitimacy. So we can say authority, okay, can be based on coercion, can be based on legitimacy. Then legitimacy can again have different forms. I think it helps to distinguish between what I call instrumental and more substantive forms of legitimacy. So for instance, most of the political science and sociology literature has this kind of idea that legitimacy is really a belief in the rightfulness. So it's very value-based. But we do find definitions, particularly in the kind of more positivist research and quantitative research, but also in policy literature, definitions of legitimacy that are really based on being useful. So for instance, if we say we improve the service delivery by the state, that's going to improve the, or that it's going to enhance the legitimacy of the state. That's kind of a terminology uh, that also in the context of Afghanistan was used quite frequently. But if we focus on the more kind of substantial side, we can kind of break down the various definitions that Weber has, tradition, charisma, rational legality, 
And then within rational legality, such as democratic context, all sorts of other literature has, of course, evolved, such as Sharp, who distinguishes between input and output legitimacy. But most of this literature really evolved and it's quite specific that it was kind of developed for Western democratic contexts. So I think that's exactly then the challenge there. So by definition, most of this work on legitimacy evolved and was based on the analysis of nation states in Europe and the formation of nation states. But what happens to legitimacy in a, con in a context where force is not nicely monopolized, like Weber suggests in his kind of ideal type of the state? It's not just not nicely monopolized, it's actually really far removed from this ideal type. It's like almost the opposite. We have kind of competing authorities. And what I would suggest, but just kind of as a backdrop for the empirical ana analysis is kind of looking at the conflict zone as a political order where there are various types of authorities that could include the state um, that are competing, interacting, um, that are in this zone together, but they don't only compete with force, they also compete over legitimacy. So I think in a context where the monopoly of the legitimate use of force is really, really limited, we by definition also have limited legitimacy or contested legitimacy. So that's it for now. I'm going to use this kind of rather abstract framework and dive into the kind of more empirical reality um, of Afghanistan between 2014 and 19 when I did my research. So basically what I try to do is this kind of strange pl playing field that we have here, try to implement that in a kind of, or look for that in a more empirical reality. And I basically, when I started my research, asked people about who they thought were authorities in the country. And kind of doing this research in different parts of the country, kind of five main actors evolved. Um, one was the state, the Islamic Republic at the time. One, and increasingly so over time, were the Taliban uh, calling themselves the Islamic Emirate. Then there were kind of individuals. I'm calling them strongmen. Other people call them warlords. Um, there's an entire debate on this. But basically individuals who kind of accumulated a lot of authority as people and kind of have their own force that they can use, not through the state, but as individuals. And then quite crucially, there were quite a few different types of community authorities, such as elders, local councils, shuras, jirgas, depending on where you go in the country, they kind of have slightly different connotations and formats, but the idea is quite similar. And then of course, the international community. So today I'm actually just very quickly going to talk about the first three, uh, but very happy to kind of discuss the other ones in uh, our discussion afterwards. But I think those three already give us a bit of a sense about how legitimacy kind of played out. How did I do this? Um, so basically, I did um, two rounds of interviews in the country. The first was in 2014-15. Um, I spent some time in four different provinces, um, in Balf in the north, in Nangarhar in the east, in Herat in the west, and in Kabul in the center. And in each of these provinces looked at three different districts, one district being the city center, one district being further away from the city center, and one district being far as away as possible from the district center. So trying to cover different geographies within these um, provinces. What's missing here is the south. So that is perhaps a limitation, but basically what's often considered to be the, the kind of heartland of the Taliban, Kandahar, Helmand is not uh, wasn't part of my study. Uh, we can later discuss the implications of that, but I do think already from these four provinces, we can learn quite a few about, uh, quite a lot about the mechanisms of legitimacy. And then in 2019, together with some colleagues, so that was very much a team effort, I went back and we did uh, another round of interviews in the West, in Herat and Faria provinces, where we really looked at people's personal experiences um, with regard to interaction with the Taliban and especially the Taliban court structure. And that's going to come up a little bit later in the, in the presentation. Apart from not having covered the South, there's another core limitation. And that is really that women were underrepresented in my study. So I think more than two thirds of my, the people I talked to were men. Um, that was very much driven by the fact that, especially in 2014, 15, I very much wanted to do all the interviews myself. And that of course created a big challenge as a foreign man 
in the country to, especially in rural areas, to to talk to women. So it simply was much more difficult, and that's reflected in uh, my my findings. So I just want you to keep that in mind. I think we can still discuss the mechanisms of legitimacy in a in a very we can generalize, but there is this limitation that's important to note. Yeah, I think most of you have probably seen a map of Afghanistan, but just to briefly outline it, um, this is Herat in the west, that's Balkh here in the north, Nangarhar in the east, uh, at the Pakistani border, Herat bordering Iran, and then Kabul here in the center. So, Again, I'm going to run through this very quickly. I think most of you know a lot about Afghanistan, so I'm probably going to bore you if I repeat this. So just in, in a one minute nutshell version, for those of you who have not read about Afghanistan or are not so familiar, the context in which I actually conducted this research and this research findings emerged. So we saw an international intervention in 2001. In October that followed 9-11, there was a US-led uh, military intervention which as its main kind of uh, goal had the war on terror against Al-Qaeda and the Taliban that were viewed as allies. But this intervention was also kind of surrounded by all sorts of other ideas and notions such as state building, democracy, human rights, women rights, liberation. So all sorts of discourses were going on over those 20 years um, in parallel to kind of what kind of initially motivated the agenda of the US. And then if we fast forward to August 2021, when the Islamic Republic collapsed or was toppled by the Taliban, a couple of things had happened. So on the one hand, we have actually quite significant successes that I do think are also worth pointing out, especially in the, in the, in the fields of education, health, women's rights, freedom of speech, like an incredibly vibrant media landscape that evolved in Afghanistan over 20 years with radio stations, TV stations. Uh, people being really critical about what's going on. Um, yeah, really a fascinating, critical debate. But at the same time, we had a state that was still highly dependent on, on international aid, was uh, characterized by corruption. These, these strongmen that I mentioned earlier, having accumulated power within the state, um, and of course, an evolving Taliban insurgency. How did the Taliban do it? So. After 2001, they quickly, kind of fairly quickly started reassembling and until 2005, six started fighting mainly in kind of fairly localized units. Um, but then from in the following years, started kind of centralizing control a bit more. And uh, during the surge when Obama moved military troops from Iraq to Afghanistan to really crack down on Afghanistan, they kind of retreated a bit again, but really used that time to build internal policies, uh, build their kind of shadow governance structures, and also conduct horrific violent attacks, often killing civilians, including in, in many of the urban areas, such as Kabul. Um, and then once the surge was over from 2015 to 19, the Taliban really kind of pushed into uh, the country and expanding their control, of not really in terms of territorial control, not actually controlling the governors building in the district center, but having a lot of influence over the population, being able to roam around quite freely at night, creating, setting up checkpoints to tax, um, and yeah, being often the kind of main authority on the ground for people in, in parts of the country at least. And then in August 2021, we of course saw the collapse of the government, and we now have a position, situation where the Taliban kind of have a monopoly of force, but we still have this question about, okay, but what about their legitimacy? Diving into that, so going a bit back in time and going to the to the period between 2009 and 14, um, I'm going to run first through the, to look. I'm going to first look at the state, and in the context of the state, I'm going to look at two branches of the state: the police and the army. Just as examples, in the book you'll find other examples such as members of parliament and so on. But I think the the police and the army is quite tangible. Um, elements of the state, and I'm going to look at strongmen and the Taliban as a, as a last example and kind of compare a little bit how people view these actors in different parts of the country and what we can learn from that in terms of legitimacy. So perhaps starting with the police. Um, when I started my research, I was really struck by the fact how negative the view 
on the police was basically throughout. Like there, there, there often are these ideas that these, there are these urban and rural divides in the country, but actually when it came to the police, there was a surprising level of agreement that this is not living up to people's expectations in terms of what they wanted to see in terms of policing in the country. And most people in these, I don't know, 270 interviews at the time had personal experiences with police interaction. And based on these interactions, they reached the conclusion that this is not particularly legitimate. And they, they in particularly pointed out that the police is incredibly corrupt um, in terms of day-to-day -day interactions and being asked for bribes and ultimately really feeling like a source of insecurity. So I even remember, for instance, an interview, it must have been 2014, of a fairly high-ranking uh, employee of the, Minister of, of the Ministry of Interior telling me, look, when I walk down the street in Kabul, if I see police on the street, I, I really want to turn around and walk into the other direction and just avoid them. Um, so this really this almost fear of the police and the police not being viewed as a form of, as a provider of security at all, but rather as a force you should be avoiding, avoiding on the street. But at the same time, people often had this disclaimer, it's like, yes, we don't maybe like the police the way it is now, but we do like police and we do like a state. So there was this, this strong belief in the, the kind of concept of a state and the concept of a police. So it wasn't that people kind of disagreed with having any of this, but the way it was kind of implemented did not live up to what people uh, wanted to experience from the police. So just to kind of illustrate that with some, some of the interviews um, in the country, Here's a quote from Nangaha, which is in the east um, at the Pakistani border, a person saying, some of my rel relatives had a fight with their neighbors. The police came and imprisoned my innocent relatives. I went to the police and they told me I got this job to make money. So if you don't give me money, I'm not going to release them. However, there were also, strangely enough, these like little pockets that were entirely different from kind of what, uh, what I kind of so in the interviews everywhere else in the country. And one of these was Fasa district, which is in the north of Kabul, um, where basically more than two thirds of the people were surprisingly happy with the police. And so for instance, one person here saying, in our community, basically security is designed in a way that involves all community members. Security is the result of close cooperation between the people and police, while neither of the parties would be able to achieve security alone. So what had happened in this community was that they, they had really kind of taken police as a community issue and half of the police force in, in Farsa was, or in this village at least, was hired from the community and the other half was hired from was hired externally, ensuring a bit of a balance between kind of knowing what's going on, but also having kind of a degree of neutrality. Um, and that and and the community would often even kind of patrol with the police together. And it was like a very collaborative issue just in this very, very small part of the country. However, unfortunately, I think this, this kind of view of the police, depending on bribes, dominated. And interestingly enough, that also was very much reflected in kind of the interviews and all of the interviews I did with the police themselves. So talking to the police, um, they were very honest and understanding of the public frustration. They said, yes, we need to make money through bribes. So there's no alternative. Like we have to pay our superiors bribes to be able to stay in this position. So there's no, there's no way out of the system. So we need to make money from the people on the street to be able to afford to be in this job. But we understand that the people don't like it. Um, and in addition to that, there was a lot of frustration with how the police was actually trained. Um, we can get into this in more detail, but basically after 2001, the police was very much set up as a, as a fighting force and usually trained for two weeks, uh, mainly in terms of handling weapons. And there was basically no training in terms of what does the constitution mean? What are my duties? Uh, literacy, literacy rate was very low. Um, and we see that here in a quote from, again, a fairly high ranking uh, police general saying, in the past, when people were recruited to the police, they were trained for six months. The training was about the code of conduct, culture, Islam, and so on. But it was not about fighting at all. Today, it is a two-week training. Then the officers are called expert of the battlefield. I did a much longer training and have 35 year, years of experience and still don't call myself expert of the battlefield. 
Then really, we I'll, I kind of conclude later, but kind of moving on to a very different type of actor, the Afghan National Army. And when I kind of naively started my research, I kind of expected people to have a fairly uniform view on the security sector, but that really wasn't the case. So with the Afghan National Army, I kind of experienced almost the opposite. People had like surprisingly positive views across the country. And even in, in some areas that were controlled by the Taliban, people sometimes would say, but the army is doing a good job. But the army had basically no presence in those areas. And there was also not much of an urban rule divide. And when, when I asked people why they thought so positively about the army, they were basically emphasizing that there was an absence of negative experience. So many people actually hadn't, ex hadn't interacted with the army much. They'd seen the army somewhere, they'd seen a convoy, they'd seen a base, uh, but they, they didn't really interact, interact on a day-to-day -day level with the army because they were staying a bit more on the countryside in their bases versus the police is kind of really present on the streets of, of the, or was present on the streets of the country. And so for instance, one person saying, I like the ANA, the Afghan National Army, because they're not involved in corruption. Or another person saying, Afghan forces are doing their duty for around 12,000 Afs. They are serving the country and sacrificing their lives. So an entirely contrary uh, kind of perception of what we saw with the police before. And it was usually the kind of keywords that came up was the absence of corruption and the service to the public. And the, I think it really came down to the absence of negative experiences, but also coupled with a general narrative in the country and media reporting that kind of illustrated the kind of good fighting that the Afghan National Army was conducting. And it really kind of resulted in this perception that they, but not the police, were doing a service to the public, whereas the police was driven by self-interest only. Also, in all fairness, we have to see that they were paid a little more than, than the police usually. Moving on to the second example, strongman. I'm going to do this very quickly, but um, as I mentioned earlier, there's an entire fascinating literature on, on kind of influential commanders, um, whatever we want to call them. But basically what happened after 2000 or during 2001 is that many of these individuals were empowered through the international intervention. Actually, much of the, the, the fighting in 2001 was not actually done by foreign troops, but was done by Afghan commanders and their forces, whereas the US and the UK were mainly relying on airstrikes. Um, so they did much of the fighting against the Taliban. They were the ones taking the city of Kabul. Um, and as a consequence, many of them became quite influential in the, in the kind of following state system as well as individuals with their kind of um, private armies that many still maintained or security forces. Um, and even though as the international community still very much relied on these people and thought they were very influential, which they certainly were in the, in the, Af in the Afghan political context, this really didn't align with how people thought about them. So, of course, they're always outliers, but um, generally speaking, people thought that those individuals were responsible for land grabbing, extortion, and were generally simply able to act with impunity. And what was used often as a terminology to describe them was that they were illegally armed, which I just found so fascinating that there was a reference to the constitution and law that these people shouldn't be having private armies that they can use to intimidate people. But while with the police and the army, there was, I would say, a strong sense of realization within the force of how they were perceived by the public. That very much aligned. So people knew how the public thought about them. That did not really apply to strongmen. I just want to put that out here as one example of one of these people are who, who I'm asked about his own claim to legitimacy or basically why he thought he had the right to be where he is. And he responded, I have a lot of experience. I know how to do it. I live with the people, with the military, with the civilians. And I was governor for 14, 15 years. I have experience and I know how to do it. And I have their support. If we, have, if we had a lot of heroes in the world, then there would be no problems. That's why the people call me hero. The hero of peace, the hero of reconstruction, the bulldozer of Afghanistan. So, of course, there's a lot of signaling going on. This was an interview situation, and I asked him about basically framed slightly differently his claim to legitimacy, and he gave me an answer in terms of how he wanted to be perceived, of course. But the, the disconnect between what he kind of claimed in terms of legitimacy and what people were actually thinking about him was very striking and really didn't match what basically all of the other authorities in the country 
uh, were saying who were at least aware of when kind of voiced it in the interviews as well about how the public thought about them. So finally, the, the kind of third example, and I'm going to spend a little bit more time on that, perhaps because they the most relevant today. So what about the Taliban insurgency and their legitimacy, if we can call it legitimacy? So the Taliban did a lot of different things. Most importantly, and I guess most famously, they're responsible for a lot of violence in the country. Even in 2021, basically before the, the government fell, they were still responsible for 700 deaths in the country just between January and June 2021. And also perhaps uh, famously, they were responsible for and are responsible today for imposing a lot of um, social strictures on the population in terms of how people are supposed to dress and so on. Um, at the same time, they did also create their own kind of governance structure though. And I think that's worth looking at. So most importantly, they created their own justice system which had three levels, really mirrored the government system, primary courts on the district level, appeals court on the provincial level, and the Supreme Court on the national level. And they successfully managed to co-opt other government services, such as education and health. So as far as I know, they basically never paid for education and health services in the areas they controlled, but they allowed the government to continue operating in their areas and then kind of gave it a bit of a twist by, for instance, enforcing that students and teachers would actually attend school and by also shaping the curriculum. And I'm, I'm sure, Sophia, you have done a lot of uh, work on education in Afghanistan, so I'm really curious to hear more about your thoughts on this. But they, they kind of shaped how people are taught and what people are taught, but they didn't actually pay for it. But they could claim that basically the Taliban are providing education. Um, and then at the same time, they axed. Um, just like the government, but perhaps in a more organized way. So they tax the agricultural sector, business activities, and crucially transportation through checkpoints on, on main roads, uh, where people would usually get a receipt that they can show at the next checkpoint and kind of prove that they've already paid, but also on, on development projects, which brought them likely a lot of money over the years. So how was this perceived? So I think with the Taliban, there was perhaps the most striking urban rural divide if we actually want to narrow it down so much, even though it is very simplistic. Um, but I'm, I'm just for simplicity reasons kind of used this here. So basically, throughout the urban areas, regardless of where you went in the country, people viewed the Taliban as their main threat to security. They would use language such as terrorists, criminals, um, and we can see that here in one quote of a person saying in, in Jalalabad, in, in the east again, but in the really in the provincial center, Taliban means the one who's seeking knowledge. But now it is nothing more than the name of an illegally armed group, which is destroying the country with bombs and suicide attacks. But then in contrast to that, there was an image of the Taliban, which was much more prevailing in areas that they actually influenced. It wasn't necessarily rural areas, so that is too simplistic, but rural areas that they where they could actually shape governance on the on the local level. And here they were perceived not through much so much through the security lens, but much more through the justice lens. And people often viewed them or described them as being the most accessible form of governance and as a provider of cheap, fast, and fair justice. So for instance, a person here in Herat which really is quite remote from the Taliban heartlands. This is like the West of Afghanistan saying in 2019, when I went to the governor, meaning the governor from the government, he wasn't listening to me. The Taliban were listening to me. So obviously the Taliban are better. So really making this point about they are closer, they are accessible, they listen. Or an example from, from the east of the country, from a from fairly rural districts in, in Nangarhar province, um, someone saying, when a person has a problem, he goes to the Taliban. The Taliban then refer the conflict to their courts. Their conflict resolution procedure is much simpler than the formal, formal justice mechanism. This decisions are made on the basis of Islamic law, and they are fast. Yes, they use force if necessary, but they are not corrupt. So people prefer the Taliban's conflict resolution. So when it became kind of a bit clearer in the interviews in 2014 that 
that justice was so crucial to how people thought about and we did this kind of follow-up study in 2019 to understand a bit more about their court system and what turned out what, what became clear was that even though in in the provincial centers uh, the taliban appeared really far away but when going out to the districts most people knew exactly where to go at what what day of the week to find the court and many people would say we did this research in Herat and Faryab, so again, very far away from the south of the country in the west and northwest of the country. Um, people would usually approach the Taliban courts in 2019 rather than traveling to the government courts. Um, and what the Taliban were doing was they kind of twice a week were meeting in a certain village at a certain spot under a tree, and people would just show up with their cases and they would get a template to fill in and that template would be given to the court and the court would then kind of invite witnesses and schedule kind of next hearings um, where they would invite people, invite the other conflict party and sometimes even kind of send out a commission to see, like, let's say, in a land right case, what was actually going on. And then after a certain amount of time, they would reach a conclusion. And again, this would be based uh, written down and there would be three copies. They would keep one and give one to each of the parties. And Yes, this was comparatively fast. So in debt cases at the time, so 2019, it took about nine days uh, for the Taliban court to reach a decision. And inheritance right cases uh, took an average three months. So it wasn't like on the spot, but compared to what people were experiencing in the, in the government courts where corruption was widespread and court cases could easily take two, uh, two three years, this was much faster. And Interestingly enough, they were using the Ottoman Empire's codification of uh, the Sharia for civil law cases, so they had a written uh, book. And so people understandably viewed this as being much more accessible than what the, what the government had to offer, especially as at that point of time in 2019, basically in many of the provinces, the government had kind of, for security reasons, moved all of the district level courts to the provincial centers to protect the judges because judges were viewed as a target by the Taliban. Um, and so there were basically no courts left in, the, in many of the rural areas. And the Taliban were, for many people, the only place that's left. And the Taliban were also not encouraging the use of government courts. So there was a lack of alternatives and people kind of appreciated this comparative speed. But also, and I think this is where we're kind of getting more to legitimacy, the comparative fairness. And the word fairness was usually tied like with the police to the absence of corruption. Not much more than that, but people were saying, we feel like we're treated equally. It doesn't matter whether someone is better connected than someone else, even though there was also corruption. So corruption came, came, uh, came through in the interviews, but people said it's less than in the government courts. So I'm, I'm going to jump this uh, but, and move to the conclusions, being aware of time. But what was interesting, and this is probably an entire paper or book in itself, how the Taliban viewed themselves. What was interesting, because I was doing research in the north, west, and east, not in the south, that many people, were, many of the people were not actually using religion much as a justification. But again, we're saying, like in this case, our main concern is not the implementation of Islamic laws, but the general absence of justice in the country and the corruption of the government. So again, this might be very different in the South at the time, but here people were kind of channeling their frustration, the kind of feeling of marginalization that the governor had taken their house, um, that something was stolen from them and they couldn't get it back because the state was too powerful. They were kind of using the Taliban as a platform uh, to kind of fight the state um, in, in terms of their own uh, sense of marginalization. Um, so where does this leave us? In terms of Afghanistan, just very briefly, so I think if we look back at the state, we can say that overall, this, the, the international community certain, and the Afghan state failed to build widespread legitimacy, but people had really nuanced views in terms of which elements of the state might be more or less legitimacy. And this really wasn't a broad brush statement that we don't want a state. No, not at all. Actually, people really thought that a state, they, they wanted the state and the state is legitimate, but the way certain elements such as the police were operating was just not in line with the expectations. And meanwhile, the Taliban really um, successfully used the justice system to add a degree of perceived of legitimacy on the local level to their more coercive authority and kind of make themselves more influential. But in a way, the state made it really easy for them because 
they basically just managed to portray themselves as the lesser of two evils. They didn't have to be particularly good to be viewed as the lesser of two evils in, with regard to justice, for instance. But then today, um, we can discuss this later, we saw all, see all sorts of challenges that now translate into the Taliban actually being in, in power. they not the lesser of two evils anymore. They're fully responsible for governance. Uh, they're becoming slower in terms of their bureaucracy, and they're focusing so much on their ideology um, and restricting human rights um, that they, they, I think, at a bit risk of undermining their legitimacy, even the little bit that they had, because people didn't consider them to be legitimate because of their tradition or their ideology, but because of the fairness of procedures. And um, currently, the focus of the Taliban is a very different one, unfortunately. So I think there's a big risk also for the Taliban to undermine their own monopoly, of course, even within the movement, because not necessarily everyone signed up to the movement for what they are doing now. Um, and what we're seeing now is kind of much more restrictive day-to-day -day practices than many people consider to be legitimate. Last slide. Where does this leave us in terms of legitimacy more generally? So kind of zooming back out of the empirical context. So I think perhaps as expected, of course, there's a lot of disagreement on who's legitimate. Basically, everyone, when asks in every country, probably has a different view on what legitimate governance looks like. But I think what was really interesting, and I think what we can generalize, that there is a lot of agreements on the mechanisms of legitimacy. What makes an authority legitimate? That may play out in very, in very differently in different villages, and people perceive it differently based on their family history and so on. But the mechanisms seem to be quite similar across these four provinces that I looked at and across the authorities. And interestingly enough, certain things that I would have imagined to be important didn't matter too much. So people rarely referred to the kind of history of an authority to explain their legitimacy. So it wasn't that much about whether this, let's say, elder or council had been elected or had gained, had kind of self-appointed uh, himself or kind of regardless of how that, that person or structure had gained authority, that, that, that was something that didn't come up too much. And similarly, the advertised ideology didn't come up too much. So it wasn't, people wouldn't say, I consider the state or the Taliban or community structures to be legitimate because they're traditional, they're Islamic, or they're democratic. Like, of course, these words came up, but usually much after kind of dealing with, with what I think is much more important, the kind of day-to-day -day interaction that people had with these authorities. So ultimately, what really came through across all interviews and across all authorities was that people were, people were really concerned with, first of all, how visible is this authority? Um, is it accessible to me? And then perhaps most importantly, what are the actions of this authority? And not the actions in terms of necessarily the outputs in terms of how many schools were built and so on, but actions in a sense of this micro interaction that happens in, when an action happens. So when a police officer stops me at a checkpoint, what is my experience? Am I feeling like I'm being treated in a fair way? Am I, do I feel like I'm being treated with respect? Do I feel like I'm being treated like everyone else? Had a massive impact um, on the kind of overall understanding of legitimacy. So people really expected authorities to treat them with fairness. And I think these micro interactions are ultimately what, what are really important in a conflict environment. I think in the absence of macro structures that kind of create accountability that link, let's say, input to output or my vote to the actions, in the absence of these functioning structures, people kind of look at accountability on the day-to-day -day level and how I how I experience uh, the interaction with the bureaucracy when I when I apply for an ID card, when I get stopped at a checkpoint, when I go to a court, is going to have massive implications to how I perceive this entire structure, the state, the Taliban community authorities, and so on. And related to that, people were very conscious about whether they thought an authority was serving the public or was viewed as self-serving or serving a foreign agenda. And the idea of a service to the public, which is so abstract and you can't really see, was again usually tied to these kind of personal interactions that people had. And this is really what, what I try to call interactive dignity, this kind of sense of being treated with respect and fairness in everyday life. It really, I don't think, should be much of a surprise. I guess everyone wants to be treated like that. But I guess in a context where there are no other accountability mechanisms, where you can't complain about the police, um, this kind of day-to-day -day interaction becomes even 
more important. I'm going to leave it at that. I probably have run over time, but thank you. Um, thanks for your talk, um, Florian. This is fascinating, and it does show the importance of doing empirical research. Right? There are all these ideas about who are the Taliban, what kind of actors are they, right? Are they good? Are they bad? That exists for the entire world, right? These rebels, this government, all these ideas, who they are, what they should be doing, but it's only empirical research, actually going to some of these places and talking to people that allows us to qualify what political scientists and political sociologists would call empirical statehood, meaning the practices of the state, right? The everyday practices of the state, or in your case, Florian, the everyday practices of public authorities, and they come in very different shapes and forms. Now it is evident, let me be a bit professorial, Florian, <laughs> it's evident that Florian is a barbarian, right? He basically thinks Weber does provide some of the analytical tools that we can use to analyze the everyday making of the state in Afghanistan by different actors. Right. Many authors have taken inspiration from Weber to study armed groups. And I do want to mention two. One of them is Klaus Schlichte, a political sociologist, also a barbarian. And his basic argument is that armed groups are faced with the following dilemma. They basically need to create legitimacy in their everyday governance of populations. And at the same time, they undo this legitimacy because they use violence. That's the basic puzzle that they are faced with. And while you didn't, I mean, you alluded to some of it, you didn't really go into detail, right? But you can clearly use this kind of framework to analyze these different armed groups, right? So Taliban, they use violence, yes, but they also do other stuff, right? Police use violence, but they also do other stuff which are maybe not that great in terms of everyday governance. Another barbarian and another old white man, I'm sorry to say, is um, Christian Lund. And he has become quite influential in the political sociology literature with his uh, framework on what does constitute a uh, public authority, right? And Lund would basically say, all the actors you describe are public authorities and they do two things. They basically govern citizenship and they govern authority. Or to put it in very simple terms, they govern who you are and what you have. But these are, I think, it's, it's important to uh, highlight some of these barbarian kind of uh, thinking that, that you didn't go into. I don't know if you use some of these frameworks. You, you remain at a, at, a very, at a very basic barbarian level, where you basically take Weber and apply him. But there have been important kind of developments in barbarian thinking. Now, some people don't like Weber. I mean, nobody doesn't really like Weber, but the idea no, is, is, is impossible. The notion itself of legitimacy is, is problematic, right? It's highly normative. So my question, and it's my first question to, um, to Florian, I have two, and I'll make it uh, short. The first question is, in your interviews, how do you like talk about legitimacy, right? I mean, they're not, they're not Germans, they're not political scientists, they're normal people. It's a good thing, right? So, how, I mean, what kind of term do you use? Because, of course, the term you use will, you know, influence the response you get. First question. And my second question is, all of us who have been studying politics and who've been studying, you know, so-called fragile states from close and from far, including Afghanistan, none of us have been surprised by the Taliban takeover, right? Similarly, none of us would be surprised if eventually Al-Shabaab would take over the Mogadishu government. Right? Not because it's, deter it's deterministic, but there are many good reasons for why that could happen. What we are, are surprised with is how is it that a good part of the international community was able not to see that? Right? How was a part of the so-called international community, the dominant part, at least the American part, able to just pretend these things didn't happen? So the everyday governance, the everyday state building that took place, yes, violent, yes, contested, but it did take place. How could that not have been seen? That's what, I, what I'm really puzzled with. Um, yes, thank you so much, Florian. I'm looking forward to your responses. And maybe, Sophia, you will go right after me or you will respond quickly. Thank you so much. <laughs>
Um, it's so good to see all of you. And I, as uh, Florian and Mitka said, I'm originally from Afghanistan and I have been working on Afghanistan for a couple of years. And it was so interesting to hear from Florian. I was looking for a source like somebody looking into legitimacy and authority in Afghanistan, and I haven't came across any until I saw your book. So thank you so much for um, investing in Afghanistan. It's a rich repository and it, you, um, it would help me. Um, I'm actually looking on decolonizing international relations. And as I think I'm just going to build on what um, Toby, Toby just said about how legitimacy, because what I'm dealing with and the issues I'm having kind of encountering in Afghanistan is that uh, being trained in the West, we have a particular set of vocabulary and particular set of mindset that we go to another country. But what happens is that kind of it doesn't, we interpret the reality based on our own training. And that the question also kind of I would like to re reinforce what Toby asked was, how did you use these terminologies like legitimacy and authority in the context of Afghanistan? Um, another thing is because I'm looking at decolonization of human kind of international relations, um, you can see as you explained that there are so many different types and sites of authority and legitimacy in Afghanistan. So what is the wider implications of your experience working in Afghanistan in reconceptualizing legitimacy or kind of reimagining legitimacy? Um, and the reason I'm asking is kind of a comment on this kind of a, it's a very loaded question. Just want to give a little bit of background on this. Um, when it comes to legitimacy, authority, alternative sites of political activity, it's very different in different kind of in different countries. In particular, Afghanistan is an ex excellent example. When it comes to international relations, their point of entry is a state. The prime actor is a state. So when it comes to countries like Afghanistan, and as you explained, the state is not as powerful. And the more you move to different districts and geographical areas in Afghanistan, the more this idea of legitimacy and authority kind of keeps reshaping itself. And it was really interesting when I looked at kind of when you looked at the perception of people and that kind of binary way of looking at how the authorities look at legitimacy and how the public looks at legitimacy. But what is the wider implications of that for, for example, let's say if not because my focus is international relations, but in general, if international community were to engage in Afghanistan, how they should go differently in Afghanistan now? And there is again a surge of international community showing interest to go back to Afghanistan. And there are a lot of people who are interested in Afghanistan and they want to go back. So how can this study and the wider implications of legitimacy and authority in a context like Afghanistan can help them to go to Afghanistan, but have a different mindset and different approach? Yeah. So perhaps first of all, how do you talk about legitimacy? Now, this is this this was really the crux, I think, of my my research project, but which I um, tried to be aware of. Basically, uh, the answer is I didn't use the word legitimacy at all. Um, I only used the word legitimacy when I kind of conceptualized my research and in the analysis phase. What I did in the interviews was actually, I, I basically created a spectrum of notions uh, ranging from kind of resistance to support and kind of get into get into people's stories and see kind of dimensions of that. But I didn't use the word legitimacy at all. And I also had a thematic lens. So I kind of tried to approach how people thought about authority by looking at different thematic areas. So for instance, as you as you saw with justice and security as two kind of concepts that also in the literature are quite closely intertwined with notions of legitimacy often. And I try to use kind of certain examples to engage with people's views on, on different authorities. And I thought, for instance, justice and security work well because basically all these authorities claimed that they were providing these things. And um, so I thought it was a good starting point to have a conversation with people and get into these notions of resistance and support. And then when talking to the authorities themselves, these were very different kind of interviews than the ones I did kind of on the street. I really kind of tried to understand their biography. And I was interested in kind of people's motivation to join an authority, if you want to call it like that. So why did you become a police officer? Why did you join the Taliban? Why, why did you kind of accumulate so many forces? Um, and so I kind of tried to understand becoming an authority and the kind of motives that underpin that and the reasoning that at least people put out into the public of why they did that to understand what what drives people's behavior but basically i must admit then kind of i i used that to analyze legitimacy and legitimacy was not a word i i used in the research um but i think 
we kind of probably always face this this challenge regardless of of where one does research so for instance what I couldn't engage with, but what I'd love to engage with in a future research project or would invite anyone else to do is kind of getting more into the notions of the words that people then use. So for instance, the word corruption, even like in Dali and Pashto will have different notions. And what does it imply? And how similar is it to my notion of corruption? So I think there's still a lot to unpack, um, for instance, with the words of fairness, corruption. Um, and of course, and I think that ties, uh, Sophia, to your point about decolonizing IR, of course, going in as a foreign researcher, I come in with a certain baggage and a certain worldview, uh, which I'm not going to get rid of. Um, so the only thing I can try to do is being as transparent as possible about how I view this, which I try to do in the book and how I kind of uh, how I fit in myself. Um, but I'm not going to be able to overcome this. But I do think there's still a lot of work that could be done on the kind of linguistic of legitimacy, uh, which is not really my speciality, but I think would be absolutely fascinating and kind of getting more into the discourse of what do these words really mean? Um, how did we miss this? Oh, I would love to be able to answer that. Um, I think in Afghanistan, and I, I can see there's some people on the call and here in the room who will have thoughts on this as well. Uh, I'd love to hear both of your thoughts on this as well. But I do think one of the, the issues, um, apart from not really wanting to see it, was that I think it's really this notion of control being linked so tightly to territory. And I think what we saw in Afghanistan was often we had these great black and white maps of who controls which district. And it was always based on uh, who controls the district center. And the Taliban, uh, and they were very honest about that in 2019 in the interviews. They often said, we don't want to take the district center. We're going to leave that to the government. They can fly their flag. The governor can come in by helicopter and leave. Um, but this way, the food aid will keep on coming. and. This, the, the, on the map, it will stay colored in the government color, but basically outside of the governor compound, the government doesn't have influence anymore. And outside of that, in Fadia, for instance, it was already Taliban uh, controlled. And the kind of push to actually formalize that wasn't too much. They just had to take, in many cases, one building to kind of make that district government, uh, Taliban controlled. Of course, dynamics were very different in other parts of the country, but often I think, I think it would help to understand population control much more than geographical control on a map, even though I personally also love maps and I think maps are really help to illustrate things, but ultimately they simplify, especially if we want to uh, map something like control or authority in a country. What are the wider implications? Yeah, another great question. Thank you. Um, so I think my, my, my starting point and the idea for this book was very humble. I've, I, I basically just wanted to understand how people, what people think and what people's expectations are. And mm -hmm. I thought, um, and I still think that many international interventions are kind of very loaded with ideas of legitimacy uh, coming out of theory, IR. But basically, there's not too much going on in terms of actually asking people about their expectations. And I, I think this is something we should generally take more seriously, regardless of uh, where this is happening in the world. Um, basically, asking people about their views uh, can't really do harm. And um, I think in this case, it illustrated that people have very basic expectations that, in theory, shouldn't be too difficult to address. Of course, they are very institutional and, and they are difficult, but the basic expectation is something we should perhaps have more as a guiding principle rather than a preconceived notion of, of what we consider to be legitimate or not, or what we think is the most pressing is issue at a certain time. Thank you very much for uh, for this discussion. Thank, thank you, you. Zulfia and Tobias for already had to leave. And thank you very much, uh, Florian, for coming all this way and for sharing your research. It was really informative and I think very highly appreciated by everyone in the audience.